On today's episode, we're speaking with Jeremy Glassenberg, who I'm very excited to have on the show. Jeremy is a platform product management leader of over 11 years now. Most recently, he has been the VP of product at PIN. And before that, Jeremy was a head of platform product management at companies like Box, TradeShift, and Edmodo. As head of platform at TradeShift, which deals with supply chain technology, he led the design of TradeShift's new developer frameworks, documentation, and developer tools. At Edmodo, which deals with education technology, he grew the Edmodo App Store to over 500 applications. Prior to that, he was the first platform product manager at Box, where he founded their developer relations team, created a community of over 15,000 partner developers, and was involved in building and monetizing the Box platform. Jeremy, thank you so much for being here. It's good to be here, Kanal. Great. So, Jeremy, I want to spend our time today on a number of topics, uh, platform and API product management, and we'll touch on a few of the stories and elements on organizational behavior as well. And then we'll finally wrap up with some advice that you have to give other product and growth professionals that want to achieve those 10x results that we're all after. Does that sound good? Yep, that sounds good to me. Great. Um, so I'm excited to have you on, uh, and I'm going to start from the very beginning. So let's dive in. Uh, first question, how is managing product for a platform different from managing product for a consumer or enterprise product? Yeah, I, so I first like to emphasize that platform product management at its core still is product management. And so I, I like to emphasize the similarities before getting into the, uh, the differences. Uh, very often people do treat APIs differently too differently from other areas of product. Uh, sometimes they believe in the um, just have built by engineers for engineers and not that it shouldn't be, um, not that engineers shouldn't be involved in the designs or even driven by design. Uh, at places like Stripe, APIs were designed just by engineers. In fact, Stripe had over 300 employees before they needed product managers at all, before they had product managers. Um, but they still were applying product process. Uh, very often, I see companies figure this is just a technical challenge. We need to build something for engineers. Let's just hand it off to our engineering team and provide really no context. What we see then are engineers taking whatever APIs the company already has internally, slapping documentation on there, and thinking it's going to work. Uh, it's the number one reason why I've seen so many APIs fail over the years. They're not designed for the actual use case of their, of their developer communities. And so um, what you have to actually do instead, even though this is for engineers, is still treat this like a product problem. It's just that your customer happens to be more technical. Uh, and if you apply proper product process, what do we do? Well, what are the kind of apps that are going to be built by the developer community. What kind of apps do we want them to build? Who are those developers going to be? And then how do you make it as easy as possible for members of that developer community to actually build those apps? So you focus on the customer and work backwards. What we see consistently is that the APIs designed for the external developer community are not going to really be the same as those internal APIs. Now, where things are different after applying proper product process is, yeah, understanding that the customer is different, the customer is technical, so what we're building will be a different product. Uh, number one, just UX and UI. Okay, APIs don't have that much of a UI component to it, although the user experience does matter when it comes to designing good documentation, a good developer portal, that's why we're seeing a lot of teams now on um, the places like Stripe have something called developer experience in addition to API platform product management. Um, also, the style of iteration is going to be different in the world of API product management. This, I think, is the most important for any product manager who starts working on APIs to understand. Uh, in the world of product management, we have to experiment, we have to iterate, conduct A-B tests, make a lot of small changes and seeing the results. And if those don't work, reverting them or continuing to build upon them. Uh, in the world of APIs, yes, we want to iterate, we want to experiment, but we have to worry more, we have to watch out more for backwards compatibility. 
little changes in the API have, big, have a big impact. They can break a lot of applications or they can break a small number of very important applications. The way these uh, integrations work, the way developers interact with APIs, it's more sensitive than when you're just working on the interface of a consumer facing product. So yeah, basically, A, still treat this like a product problem, but B, understand the rules of API product management, especially backwards compatibility. That goes back to developer empathy and just understanding how to design your product for the long term in a way such that you can iterate, but in a way that's still different from what you may do anywhere else when you're focusing just on a UI product. Makes a lot of sense, Jeremy. Can you tell us what tools you use to enable standardization of API design, um, which is making it easier to create APIs for developers to use and so on? You know, and maybe that's frameworks for designing APIs, open API specs, uh, or services that can auto-generate this stuff. There's that, that issue of backwards compatibility in APIs that does make API design different from other areas of product. So do you design APIs for backwards compatibility? There are ways of building APIs such that you can make certain adjustments, add optional input parameters, add to the output without breaking existing applications. Um, but you have to design your APIs so that you can make those adjustments over time. Uh, we have found are certain standards that help with that. A RESTful API architecture there's also GraphQL now, which is another kind of standard for design. Uh, and these APIs are designed for that, th these type of standards, they help on two fronts. One, ensuring that you are designing APIs that are pretty scalable, um, but two, designing APIs that are consistent, not just within your company, but with other companies as they're designing their APIs. Now that we have APIs all on a RESTful standard, it's easier for other tools to integrate. So we're seeing these connectors like Ift, Zapier, Moonsoft, it's much easier for them to implement integrations and connectors if these services, even if they're providing different functionality, they're doing it all under a certain kind of consistent standard. Uh, now to build on REST, uh, what's basically become the, the standard for RESTful design is this, API, is this open API schema. It's basically a definition file for what are the function names, what are the inputs, what are the outputs, let's make sure the outputs are consistent. And if you define your API in that schema, there are a lot of tools built around that now. <clears throat> so it's very easy to generate good API documentation right off of that schema. It's also easy to generate some basic um, API libraries. If you want a JavaScript library, a Python library, or something to give, the developer community some starter code, you can auto-generate it when you have that schema. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very emphatic about using the, the open API schema that's become the de facto standard now for RESTful architecture. Um, for those who are thinking about GraphQL, I don't think we'll have too much time to talk about that here, but GraphQL when it was launched, it was launched with a schema. So just build on that schema, it helps you to design your API as well, and then it allows you to more easily launch all these other things that make for a good a developer developer ecosystem. Awesome. Um, what are some of the different types of personality traits you've come across in working with PMs and other cross-functional team members, and which ones have you found to be mo the most effective? Uh, when I've seen product managers, there's actually, I think, a spectrum in your style of interacting. Uh, we've talked about how there are ineffective PMs. The most ineffective I know of are the, the pushover PMs. The ones who, you know, something comes in from sales and they'll let the company just get sales driven. Or something comes in from a manager uh, and they just, they just do what they're told. Uh, I'm emphatic, by the way, as someone who has been the first product hire at several startups, that you know, your job as the first PM at a startup is to support the vision of your founder. Supporting the vision doesn't mean building everything that they ask you to build. It does mean questioning, criticizing the vision, and sometimes flat out saying no. You're responsible to execute. You may actually come, come up with from your own research data that says this is not the right idea. 
So on one side of the spectrum, though, is this pushover. The ones that are very friendly, um, but it's easy just to, to, to just crush them. Someone is going to come in with, a, with an idea, and if they're the strong personality, the strong personality wins. On the opposite end of the spectrum, and I've seen this one misinterpreted, the bulldozer PM, the one who does whatever is necessary to get something done and they will leave a trail of destruction in the process. What I also find is that the bulldozer personality is associated with ego. Ego is not correlated with empathy. And so these bulldozer PMs are more likely to be driving their own ideas, what they think is cool, not based on real data, and they're gonna force the company in the wrong direction. What we have in the middle is you start to get into the sweet spot. My, my favorite is what I call proactive. That means you really are trying to get feedback from other people. It's not necessarily about consensus. It's not about saying yes to everyone, but you want to actively get feedback from everyone. You're very much listening to people. At times you're saying no. At times you're not waiting for someone's permission. There is always that, you know, do you, do you ask for permission or beg forgiveness? There's something in the middle in the proactive part of the range where you let people know what you are going to do and you give them a certain amount of time to respond and challenge you. If they don't respond, by default, you will take action because you have to take action. You can't just let them stall by not responding or not prioritizing this thing, but you want to make sure that they know what you're going to do and that they have an option of coming to you if there is a concern. Uh, there's one more that I noticed. I used to just say that there's pushover, bulldozer, and proactive. Uh, there is one more that I've seen. I call it aggressive, where the person does have good ideas. They do listen to people. They are high in empathy, but they struggle a bit in communication. And maybe they are pushing something a little bit harder than they should. They may be unintentionally interruptive in a conversation. They may just have a little bit of sensitivity. It's hard for them to take some criticism. Um, and so they're not pushing hard, but they may still be a little bit difficult about getting feedback, about interacting with people. And they may push an idea a little bit more than they're supposed to. Um, I emphasize if you're hiring PMs, watch out for a pushover. Either train them, and if they're ineffective, transition them out, they shouldn't be a PM. Bulldozer, flat out fire them. Give them a chance if they're junior, but if they're senior and they're doing it, don't deal with them because you're probably dealing with narcissism. If they're aggressive, try to alleviate their concerns. It may be a discomfort thing, um, or it may be okay just to try to work with it. You can, you can work with it, but the ideal is someone who's proactive. Makes a lot of sense. Um, where do you fit in the range out of curiosity? And I mean, nobody is, uh, everybody I, I, I found you know, shifts at different times and um, which ones have you found uh, yourself fitting into most? At times I may have been a pushover and at times I may have been aggressive as I developed more customer empathy and told myself, don't just build what you think is cool. Uh, as I learned not to just do what an executive was telling me, even if it was a good idea, I managed to get myself into the proactive range. Uh, I do think as you develop experience, as you get really good at the job, you should, to be successful, be more and more in that proactive range and stay in that range. Mm -hmm. There really is no reason to ever go pushover or mm -hmm. aggressive. When you're in that proactive range, there is flexibility in how to respond depending on the circumstance that you're in. Sometimes you're really making sure that you're listening to people. Sometimes there's a strong personality on the other end and you have to seem more aggressive by pushing back harder, but it's not actually being aggressive. It's part of being proactive and just dealing with, you know, the different circumstances. Makes sense. Um, so we've all worked with APIs, but how do you define an API? Yeah, my parents still uh, struggle to understand exactly what I do. Uh, in, its, in its simplicity, I say that an API, and usually I will focus on web APIs. APIs is the stuff that lets some stuff talk with other stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's dive in deeper and say that APIs are a way for code, for applications 
to communicate with each other. So when I am going to www.gmail.com, what's happening is that the browser is going to Google and Google is sending data, my email information, and also information how to create an interface, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, that I can see. So it's a way, HTML and all this is a way of translating computer stuff when I'm asking for information from Gmail into something I can see. APIs is a format by which an application can go to Gmail and say, I need this information. And it provided in a form that the applications can understand. But all it's about is allowing applications to, to talk with each other. My simpler example, I usually go into just a mobile application. I say, have you ever worked with some app that wasn't built by Facebook, but it clearly connects with Facebook? That's how it's done. APIs are the way that Facebook lets other applications interact with Facebook so that you don't have to interact with Facebook directly. Makes sense. I mean, in addition to interacting with Facebook directly. Ah. <laughs> right. Makes sense. Um, so what is the value proposition of an API or developer platform? Um, and you mentioned that there's a, there's a number of business models and value props uh, for platforms. Uh, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, there are many ways that an API can benefit a company. We've already talked about a box of three ways that it did, bringing us customers, providing features that we couldn't build ourselves, and also enabling customers to connect box with all the stuff that they had. In Edmodo's case, it was about enhancing the educational experience by letting third party uh, educational app developers that were trying to get apps in the hands of teachers do it and then allowing teachers to bring apps into, the, into homework assignments, into their class more easily. So sometimes it's about stickiness, sometimes it's about upsell, sometimes it's about bringing in new customers. Uh, there are many models. It is important though to know what those are before you start building APIs. Uh, I turned down an offer from a unicorn startup once that was super excited about APIs. I met half the VPs, I met their CEO, I met their CTO. They all were ready to invest in APIs. They said they were committed. What was the reason? Because if we don't build APIs, we're just not going to stay competitive and we're going to fail. Hmm. At one point, I go and I meet uh, the VP of sales in the interview process. The VP of sales is very excited. And I say, so what were the use cases for APIs? Got a blank stare. I asked, okay, well, let me rephrase this. What are some cases where, because this is you know, a sales-driven company. I'm not one of us in sales-driven, but it was a B2B company that relied on just direct revenue from customers. So, what, so I asked, what are um, cases where you couldn't close a deal because you were missing something? You just couldn't solve this one problem that customers had that you think could have been solved by integrating with a partner? Not much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was in the box and I had less than 20 people, the use cases, the value proposition was there early on. But even at that unicorn company, it wasn't really there. They were trying to build APIs because they thought it was cool. I didn't take that offer, and I'm glad I didn't. I'm not going to say who it was, but the APIs didn't, didn't go far there. Uh, I had actually an interview with, I'm not going to say who, but it was a, one of the Decacorn companies. Uh, I interviewed there a couple of times, and every time there were different people running the developer platform, every time I would ask, I would share a few ideas of what I thought were good use cases, and I'd find that either they were already launched or they were about to be launched, and they didn't really have any other use cases. Finally, like a couple of years later, when, when I interviewed there again, they basically said, despite having, I, I don't want to share the names, so I have to be careful about who they sure. were, but it was tens of millions of users at least, a very large company. Logically, there would be a need for a platform, but they evaluated it, and based on what they were building, they said they had a need for an API, but the use cases were fairly small, and um, those, that small number of use cases were very important, they were generating a lot of revenue, but they realized they didn't need a massive platform team. They kind of figured that out over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do need to really think over when does it make sense to launch a platform? I, I actually say play conservatively here. Don't do it until you see a key opportunity, either bringing in new customers, 
stickiness, you know, needing to close sales deals, knowing that this is solving a problem that you know your customers have. Makes sense. Um, what are some of the business models uh, that you've found um, that can be built on top of APIs? We talked about the value proposition and you know, being valuable, like, important use cases. Uh, that is really important before you invest in a platform and an API stack. But what are some of the business models that can come out of, uh, out of this? Yeah, and if I were to summarize these ones where, where I've been, these are all cases where um, the, the, the platform is complementary to some sort of customer facing uh, service that the company is already providing. Box provides an interface, mobile apps to upload files, download files, organize and collaborate. And Moto was for teachers to interact with their students. There was an interface to it. And the APIs were complementary to that core product. Um, in those cases, well, one of the business models was just, this is just about satisfying customer needs, getting new customers, solving problems for customers. Yes, Box had some sort of a rev share. Um, but the bigger thing for us was really just solving our own customer problems through third parties. Uh, and that's why, and they tested monetization other times. Sometime after I left, they actually got very creative and to encourage developers to build integrations. They had a rev share by which they would basically say, um, if a high paying customer is using a certain application heavily, regardless of whether that customer came directly to sales and added that integration later, Box is actually gonna pay out a rev share to that app just for being used by a paying customer. Now at Edmodo, the model was more of a monetization play where they wanted teachers or administrators to pay for these applications and then there would be a rev share between, a revenue share between Edmodo and the partner. So um, the marketplace was both for stickiness to keep our, our teachers active and, and using the product, um, but also giving a reason for also an upsell, giving teachers and administrators a reason to actually pay for Inmodo by buying these, these third party apps. So there, there was some direct monetization through a revenue share with our partner. Uh, now there are times when you just flat out charge for API usage. Uh, Box did charge for API usage when we had customers building apps for internal use. Um, at companies like Twilio and Stripe, where the product is fundamentally an API, yeah, what they have to do is just charge for actual uh, API usage. So I think what we talked about there were four or five business models among the dozens of uh, business models for, for platform world, but hopefully this, this gives a good, you know, starter insight as to, to how to do it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Jeremy, what are some of the unique product management challenges when it comes to APIs? Uh, I think we talked about some of this already, um, but I'd say okay. first treat this as a product problem. Uh, and this is where I think, you know, sometimes the API PIMs can be unique and that they do have to be technical, but they still have to have customer empathy. Uh, that's why I've seen a lot of product managers fail here. Uh, sometimes they are great in customer empathy, but they don't have experience in developer empathy. Uh, sometimes they have experience in the technical front, but it's not sufficient to say, um, I've seen a lot of APIs rebuilt based on we have to get these to you know, RESTful architecture, but they still don't design API as for the needs of the external community. So the big thing is still treat this like a product problem. Um, and I think the rest is really watch that challenge of backwards compatibility. Knowing RESTful API architecture and the open API specification will be very helpful. Those are tools to guide you. Um, it is best to dive in deeper and understand from other experiences what to watch out for to make sure that your APIs um, will scale as you need to expand the API endpoints, um, add to the endpoints, and basically continue to enhance your APIs over time. Great. Um, what are some of the most common mistakes you see people making when designing and launching APIs? So uh, we've talked before about developer empathy, uh, how I've seen this right. play out in, in practice. Uh, the first being, Let's just make it by engineers for engineers. Hand it off to the engineers, give them no context. The engineers are working on other things, 
you know, thinking, what do I do with this? Okay, well, we already have a bunch of APIs, so, and we already maybe have an open API specification for our internal APIs, so let's just make some good documentation, make it possible to, for developers to register API keys, and then just, just launch that. Uh, so what you have then are a bunch of APIs that are based on internal use cases. What are those internal use cases? It's probably really closely designed to your database and meant for optimization. It's like a product manager saying, okay, here's what we need to build. Let's go and design the database first and then just slap an interface on the database and assume that that's, that's gonna work. That's how you have the, the Pied Piper app kind of situation. Um, the next level of error I see is where they say, okay, well, we've built, we have an API that was used for the mobile application that we built. Let's go and open that API to the public. That's better than just launching these internal APIs based on your database, um, because here at least it was based on some sort of an external use case, that mobile app that was customer facing but it's only one use case. It's very limited. So it will work a little bit better, but it's still not gonna work that well. How to do it successfully is to think, what are the apps that we need from the community and work backwards. Uh, I've written some, some blogs, I used to do some writing for a programmable web where I reviewed APIs as they would launch. And I could tell when some, th when some popular companies launched their APIs taking one look that this was a case of taking some internal stuff, slapping documentation on there, and then just, just launching it. And I would interview these companies and confirm that's what they were doing. What are they thinking? Oh, this is just an MVP. We're going to get feedback. Product managers know that an MVP isn't a bad product. It's a minimal product. You've probably planned out something better, a long-term plan, and then you figure out here's where we start taking your internal APIs and slapping docs on there, that's not doing that. That's not an MVP. And they wonder why it fails. They also have this philosophy that you don't see anywhere else in product management, this set it and forget it thing. Like you just, the whole idea is you don't need business development anymore. You can just make this thing self-service. Mm -hmm. um, but they also think that goes with, if you build it, they will come. I literally hear that verbatim. If you, if you build it, they will come when it comes to APIs. We know it doesn't work anywhere else in product management. You can't just build what you think works. Maybe you built it according to product, man, according to, to product process, but you still have to launch it properly. Right. Uh, and, and in fact, if we actually look at where did that quote, if you build it, they will come, came from? It was the movie uh, Field of Dreams where what they actually bring are the ghosts of the, uh, the White Sox players who actually took a bribe to throw a World Series game. So when you think about it, it was a great movie. But when you think about it, even in that movie, if you build it, they will come. The philosophy there didn't really bring the kind of customers you ordinarily want. Okay, so we've talked about the failures when it comes to launching a, a, a platform and APIs. What has contributed most to your success in launching APIs and platforms? It goes back to developer empathy. And I think you can share a good story at Box where I ended up just getting forced to do the right thing. I initially wasn't applying good product process and, and we got lucky that the right circumstances came about. Uh, when I joined Box, I was focused on supporting certain types of partner integrations. And there was a challenge at Box where they needed to set their goals right. Uh, for a little while, there was a goal of just getting as many partners as possible. That wasn't aligned with getting partners that actually generated value. Um, but I was working on these because I thought all those partnerships were kind of cool. And I was creating some friction with the sales team. They were getting frustrated. They were taking up time for these integrations when they had clear customer requests. Not can get in the whole don't be sales driven, but what I will say is that the box sales team didn't want the company to be sales driven, but they did believe in the company being sales influenced that we should be taking their feedback. What ended up happening during this time of friction with sales is at one point I was brought into a customer call to help them with something where they thought an API may come up. And 
ended up being sig significant more than we realized. Uh, this was a very large customer in the company's history uh, at, at, for that time, and they were asking for some very one-off features. Uh, the sales team actually was about to say no to the deal because they understood that it's not worth forcing engineering to build something really custom and one-off just to close a sales deal. They didn't want the company to be too sales-driven that way. And they were about to actually say no to this deal. And I said, hey, everyone, this is entirely your decision, but to make sure all options are out there, based on what they're actually trying to do, the stuff that's custom, I think if we build a couple of um, administrative APIs that we know other customers down the road are probably going to want, and we ask them to build and maintain the other stuff that's really custom, with the pitch that's in their interest to do it, because if they need to update it, they can do it freely, we might be able to make this work and not have to actually do anything that we have to maintain that's just for them. And that's what got this conversation started that became unofficially a sales engineering process. So by making my way over to some, suddenly becoming a sales engineer, which I didn't want to do, I couldn't stand it. I got really frustrated at times, but looking back, it was the best thing for my career because it forced me to develop that customer empathy, to get very close with the customer, and to from there apply proper product process and to say going forward, whatever we're building on the APIs is aligned to the needs of our customers. So Inbox's case early on, when it was, there, it took a little while to really argue with um, a lot of people had mixed opinions about the platform, this was worth doing. I was solving problems directly for the customers. And as Box got more data driven, I could pull up the numbers to show when we had a small team that we were generating value, that we were a necessary part of the sales process that could then justify expanding the platform more. But again, based on what customers really want. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so what are the most effective and ineffective strategies for growing a developer ecosystem? So first, know the use case. That goes back to developer empathy. What are the kind of apps that you want? What are the goals? Is this about getting new customers? Is this about monetization that you want to have an apps marketplace? Um, and then designing everything accordingly. But the next part, that secret sauce to Box and to Edmodo was understanding developer relations. Uh, as John Musser noted in that top 10 list what developers can't stand working on API, eight, nine, and 10 were about API design. One, two, and three were about support, documentation, communication. I learned that when I was at Box. In our early days, our APIs were not RESTful. They were not going by generally recommended design guidelines. There were quite a few issues with the APIs and product itself. Um, but we were able to work around it by building a few solutions that we knew to be important for, for our developers based on our feedback. And also, we were just highly responsive to developers when they had questions. Many times developers were coming to Box after trying to build on one of our competitors, I'm not gonna say which ones, but uh, they would come to Box after initially hearing about a competitor and then saying, you know, we wanna work with you more because you're actually answering our questions. Uh, I remember one time at four o'clock on a Sunday, a, a developer reached out to me actually complaining about the design of our APIs which was rare because we had built these API libraries and tools to kind of cover some of the limitations of the APIs themselves. But before 4.30, he got an email from me saying, yeah, thank you for email. We completely understand. Yes, we know that certain APIs are not RESTful. It's more this style of API. We are working to improve upon it. It's gonna take some time, but in the meantime, people have just been working off our API libraries and it's, it's done the trick. And that developer responded just completely surprised. You know, he wasn't giving us, he wasn't arguing with us. He, he just you know, was being very direct with us. And he just knew that he was so surprised to get a response in under 30 minutes on a Sunday. So I always say design developer platforms in principle to be self-service, but in practice, developer relations, developer support is vital to, to the success of a platform. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so how can a company turn APIs into a developer platform? Uh, what are the steps they need to do? And how do you know that you, well, how do you know whether you should do it? And how do you know that you've gotten there once you've started doing it? 
Yeah, I think we've already talked about, you know, use case, making sure that you only build APIs when there's really a need, designing those APIs accordingly. Um, but I think you're well, also asking, your, when do we, or we could get into the, when would you say that this is actually a platform and not just APIs? Because it is very common for companies to start with APIs, allow you know, mobile app to integrate, but is that really a platform? Right. I'd ask, how do you define a, a, a platform, particularly a developer platform? That word has been used a lot in the last decade. It's quite a popular buzzword in Silicon Valley. Um, I have my own definition. There, is, there isn't really an official definition of a developer platform, um, but I'd say at its core, it becomes a platform when applications can be built entirely on what you're providing. So if you just have APIs and others are building apps and running them elsewhere and they're connecting and what they're, the way they're integrating is a simple feature, you have APIs. When you start to see a product that's built entirely on your APIs, like in Box's case, a desktop application in the sidebar that's syncing constantly with Box and providing particular information for customers, Okay, this is now a product that relies entirely on Box. Uh, so is it that the tech is dependent or is it that the business is, is dependent? I think it's more important that you have a business that's starting to actually run on your platform and products being built that are built entirely by working off of your platform. Uh, one shortcut I do have though is that um, I say that if you have a pretty nice system for apps to integrate into your interface itself, uh, then you probably already have a platform. If apps are literally running in, in your UI. Although I think the real clear definition is when you built it such that new businesses are created and are running on your system, which is really one of my favorite things about building a successful developer platform. My top two really were getting to build out product teams and developer relations teams and training developer advocates to become product managers. So creating those jobs and helping people get their careers started, but then also seeing partners really succeed. Businesses form, companies literally, people literally creating companies that are running on your platform and allowing these businesses to happen. Those business opportunities just never would have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. Great. That makes a lot of sense. What are some tips that you have to give companies when they are rolling out a new release of their APIs? And you've talked about backward compatibility uh, and breaking changes, but how do you ensure backward compatibility and a smooth transition when, when you're a company rolling out APIs? So from a small tactical level, when it comes to backwards compatibility, and, and this can probably be an entire talk on its own, how to you know, make sure you actually have backwards compatibility, um, but I would say if you are, you know, if you're removing anything uh, from either the input or the output, that could break a call. Obviously, if you're removing a function, that's going to break things. If you're changing the name of a function, that's going to break things. If you're changing the inputs, uh, the name of the inputs, you're changing the name of the outputs, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break something in the API. If you're adding to an API, adding a new endpoint, it's probably fine. Um, if you're adding a new optional input parameter, fine. If, if developers were to use that API, they just, you know, they don't have to use that input. If you're adding something new to the output but not changing the structure of the output, that's probably fine as well. You're, you're not likely to be breaking anything. There are some caveats if you're adding output though, but well, let's not get into that there. Um, it's just when you are fundamentally changing something to an API, warning, there may be a backwards compatibility break. And so sometimes you do have to do that. There are different ways of approaching it. Um, if it's a security issue, I say that you can justify doing more of a hard, like we need to break this thing immediately. Um, when that happens, I also check to see how many developers are using it. If it's just an input to an endpoint, something niche, maybe it's a smaller number of developers, you might be able just to reach out to them directly and say, hey, are you okay just making a change over the next you know, 14 to 30 days? Um, but if it's not a security thing, and it is a popular API. I'm a big advocate of sunsetting, of 
deprecating APIs. So that you basically say, we have a new API endpoint, all existing developers, basically your API keys were created before a certain date, you're allowed to use this API. It's gonna stay in our documentation with the disclaimer that it's deprecated. And any new developer who comes on board and creates a new application, you have to use the new endpoints. You're not allowed to use the deprecated endpoints. They were deprecated as of a certain date. That means it's only accessible to applications that were created prior to that date. Uh, I also give the disclaimer, especially when it comes to B2B APIs, if you want to create a new version of an API entirely, go from a V1 to a V2, not just changing an endpoint here or there, mm -hmm. uh, assume that you will need to maintain the old API for at least three years. Wow. I've seen companies attempt it in one year. Sometimes they are, but not in the world of B2B software. It's, it's, it always takes three years. Hmm. Interesting. Let's get a bit technical now. So what are, when it comes to APIs, what are web hooks and web sockets? And what's it? Yeah, I do encourage. I do encourage people when um, when building APIs and designing APIs to think outside the box. I'm a big fan of embedded integrations. Uh, I may be writing some stuff soon on that topic as to how you can enable third parties to safely customize your interface. Uh, but another area of key importance to consider web hooks and, and web sockets. These are basically real-time notifications to your apps. Um, the way I like to explain, if I were ever asked in an interview, how do you, you know, explain web sockets to, to a five-year-old? Well, maybe not to a five-year-old, but have you ever been on a phone call we're calling Southwest Airlines? I love Southwest, the best customer service of any airline. They were the first to do this. You call them up and no one, no agent is available at this time, so you're going to have to go on hold. Now, besides the fact that Southwest rarely has a 60-minute hold time, for them it's like five or 10 minutes, but um, what they did differently from others is rather than when you wait, rather than make you wait and just listen to really annoying music for, for 10, 15 minutes, they just said, give us your phone number and we will call you back. So you don't sit there listening, polling, are they ready, are they ready, are they ready? Instead, Southwest will let you know when they're ready. That's a webhook. It's a reverse API. Uh, in Box's case, we had certain integrations that needed to know when files were being uploaded into Box and then act accordingly. So how do they do that? One way is polling, which is basically constantly calling our, our API, probably our updates API, to see what events are happening in Box. Uh, ooh, was there an update in the last 10 seconds? No, okay, well, I'm gonna call in 10 seconds. Say, is there, what, has there been an upload now? It's inefficient for you. It's inefficient for your partners to have to do this. Right. The webhook is instead, we, the partner has some server endpoint where they let you know to let them know when up, up uploads happen and they can say we're, we're, we're trying to lock in we want to enable a webhook for upload events in box when upload happens in a, an account we make it we make a call to their api letting them know that the upload happens uh web sockets if you're curious it's basically a, a stream so depending on the type of events that we're looking for that may be more efficient than either polling or webhooks webhooks are more when an occasional event occurs, we should let you know that that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, web sockets could be that we know there's going to be a lot of activity that we need to watch. So we're going to be constantly listening. It's mm -hmm. also known as long polling. It's just a more efficient way of just keeping this constant stream of access for what's happening. Like a chat interface or something. Yeah. Got it. Uh, what are Swagger and API Blueprint? And what other tools do you recommend for a company interested in building, building out their APIs and opening up their APIs to third-party developers? I just realized it's actually been a while since I've been asked about uh, API Blueprint. Well, we could go into just a, like, a little bit of history of yeah. API definitions now. So there's been an evolution of APIs. Uh, there's, there used to be something called SOAP which was a very heavy API. Nobody likes using that anymore, but occasionally yep. you see it in legacy enterprise software. One nice thing about SOAP, SOAP though, is they had something called the WSDL, uh, which was the schema defining the APIs. 
And so you can actually use that to like auto-generate a, a library of code to interact with that API. Mm -hmm. When we moved towards REST, where everything was simpler, <clears throat> things were a little disorganized. Uh, there was something called a WADL, which nobody used. It was a way of trying to define REST APIs similar to a WSDL and SOAP. Didn't really fly well. And as APIs had also evolved from XML to JSON, which was just far more efficient and loved and just overtook XML very quickly a few years ago, <clears throat> what also came about was Swagger. We tried one more time as REST APIs, which were flexible, were still coming back to RESTful API design, some sort of consistent structure design. And Swagger was the schema to design those in RESTful format with JSON. Uh, there were also competitors, though, to Swagger. Uh, API Blueprint and MuleSoft had something called uh, RAML. Uh, there was a time when I used API Blueprint over Swagger. Uh, I always thought that Swagger really was the best, but at times API Blueprint had like through some community developer a way of creating really good API documentation automatically. Uh, but at this point, all of this is actually merged into the open API specification. Uh, it was basically the next generation Swagger, but they called it Open API. So that's really the new standard. So if you've heard Ramble, API Blueprint, or Swagger in the past, you usually hear Swagger a lot still. It's all basically consolidated with everyone agreeing onto Open API as being really the, the, the official standard. Uh, now within that, there are other tools that you can use alongside um, Open API. There are many tools that generate documentation and that allows you to do what Stripe did years ago, that three column documentation. Just Google if you don't know what I'm talking about, three column API documentation. Once you have an open API specification, it's really easy to generate that. Uh, and I've seen a lot of different tools on top of that. Uh, API Matic uh, specializes in building API SDKs off of that documentation. Uh, there are tools like Apiary and, and Postman, that are there to actually help to create the open API specification. Um, and if we go to other tools over time, like Kong, um, they're building out their own, um, you know, developer portal framework. A lot of these tools, they allow you to just import an open API specification and auto generate documentation, other features off of it. So um, I haven't actually admittedly, I haven't looked at the latest that Kong has for that framework. Last I checked with Kong was a work in progress. But I anticipate over time, those frameworks to actually build your own developer portals to able to just utilize the, uh, the open API specification to just auto manage all of these aspects for, uh, for the core product to a successful developer program. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that insight. Um, I, and I'm not sure if we've addressed this question already, but at what stage should a company consider building and opening up its APIs to third party developers? We did talk about it a little bit, um, but my emphasis here is, is do it when you clearly have a use case and you can see that there is demand. Either you feel that you can reach out to developers who can bring you customers, or you see that customers have a need that you're not able to solve yourself, and then it starts to make sense to build out those, those APIs. Different companies, for different companies, this happens at different stages. For Box, it made sense very early on. Uh, but I've also worked with unicorn companies where even at a billion, even at 10 billion, it didn't make sense. Um, some of the companies whom I've consulted for, they just crossed the billion dollar mark. They just started looking into it. And maybe they were a little bit late to the game, but not that late. And that was okay. They had more confidence that we could you know, look, at look at what customers need and say, yeah, you're definitely at a point now where if you build APIs based on the needs of the customers that you have now, maybe it was an SMB solution that transitioned to enterprise and made more sense to the enterprise. Now it starts to make sense to actually, um, to actually build, build and launch these. Uh, but yeah, don't just go in and start building, building APIs because, because you think they're cool. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Jeremy, let's dive into your background a little bit more and talk about advice you have to give other PMs. Uh, when, you have, when you're starting with a new product role, and you've done this a few times now, uh, what have you found to be, the, to be the most challenging and how have you gotten past that challenge? 
So PMs need to communicate effectively very well, not just to drive their own vision, but to get feedback from the right people. So at any, every company I've seen is different processes, but more importantly, different cultures. So it's important early on to get to know as many people as possible. Uh, I've encouraged at times when I've had interviews to be interviewed by more people before they actually give me the offer because I want to make sure that those people know me, that I know them, and that we think we're, we're going to have a good rapport. So for engineers, there are different kinds of engineering personalities. Uh, when I was a trade shift, I worked with engineers in San Francisco, Denmark, and China. Denmark was very direct. They don't sugarcoat. San Francisco was kind of sugarcoaty. China and Chinese culture, they're, they sure coat much more um, than, than in the United States. It's a very indirect form of communication. And uh, you have to be aware of that. You also have to be aware, are, are certain engineers just not a fan of product managers? Which engineers are going to be more upfront with you about their concerns? Which are going to be uncomfortable and just, you know, be good troopers but not share when they're uncomfortable? Which ones really are just going to pull some shenanigans because they don't want to work with with um, with an engineer and they don't want to work with a PM uh, and then you also have to make sure to be have really good um, lines of communication with sales if you're in B2B with customer success with those people who are going to be getting you the feedback from from customers a little secret I've learned when you're at companies at a few hundred there are certain people in sales certain people in customer success who are better at consolidating that feedback and sharing it with you. It's not necessarily in a managerial position. There are just certain people who are just happier to talk with other teams. And you have to know who those people are. They're going to be your better sources of communication and keeping up with what's going on. Yeah, I've seen that too. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and you kind of touched on this already, but in your opinion, what makes a great product manager? Obviously, communication is a key part of it. Um, but what qualities do they share? And are they, are they common across these different companies you've worked at? Yeah, yeah we've talked about the, uh, the customer empathy and growth mindset aspect, yes. but I think we can dive in, dive in more here. Uh, I do say that you, you no longer need the engineer MBA combo. It does help because it is good to have business skills and technical skills, but there's a lot more to it. Uh, and I break product management skills into two areas. There is the growth mindset and customer empathy, which emphasize whatever background you're from, you have to be, you have to have that. You have to have both of those. You have to be great at both of those. Uh, next are actual, are like practical skills. And in practical skills, I'd say there are a handful of things that all PMs have to be good at. And then one or two things among those skills that you have to just be great at. That goes to design skills, technical skills, communication skills, uh, and, and business sense. And so you have to at minimum, you know, be able to communicate reasonably well, have enough technical chops to be able to talk with engineers, have enough design sense to be able to work with a design team. Um, and then you have to be great at one of them. This is why as we're building out product teams, we know it's important to diversify backgrounds and why we now have people from a diverse set of backgrounds in education, because it helps to have someone who's specialized in front end, a former designer who not only knows how to work with design, but really understands the latest learnings and usability in designing a good onboarding interface, designing the front end overall. Those who are working on APIs and developer facing tools, it's best to have someone who has an engineering background or a computer science background so that they not only know how to uh, work with engineers, but they really understand how to design things that are more technical and occasionally code and prototype things. So that's where you start to diversify the team. Maybe have those who are more experienced in administrative tools or pricing decisions. And those can be more of the enterprise PMs, the ones that have the, the MBA or the business background. Uh, so being, you, have to, you have to be good at all of those, but then you have to have your specialty, the uh, superpower, some say, which is just to be great in one of those pillars. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so, Jeremy, what advice do you have to give other product managers and group professionals that want to you know, achieve those 10x results that we all want? Um, how can one be 
super successful as a product manager, especially in platform product management. There's, there's a professor of mine in B school, um, Robert Kelly, who wrote this book, he, or he co-authored this book, Developing Star Performers. He taught a lot of secrets that go well with growth mindset about what really, what star performers are, but also where do they come within a career? People don't start as star performers. You usually are not going to do that well at your first job. I would say if you have growth mindset, you're going to be positioned to fail a few times and learn. But what happens is at some point, a few years into people's careers, they're growing, growing, and then suddenly those are the stars. Most people don't ever hit that point. What happened was that they, they learned certain things, they figured certain things out, how to work more efficiently, how to be more productive, how to communicate more effectively to execute well. And you know, we talk about a lot of these things, like the need for communication, some things tactically to watch out for. What I say to get there is one, have growth mindset, have empathy, drop ego, learn how to learn faster. And it's simplicity about developing star performers. The PMs I know who've had a good career over 10, 15 years who moved up, they all learned how to learn faster. When I came into product management, there wasn't that much information out there as to what a PM actually was. And over the years, as I saw from training people who weren't engineer MBAs, what it really took, and saw the community sharing and blogs and newsletters on Slack, what actually, what a good product manager was. Conferences forming, product school and other boot camps and training courses forming. Now we finally have all that information that we didn't have before, but consequently people had to learn it the hard way. And so they had to learn how to learn faster, especially as technology improves. That I find is really vital. That, that goes with, uh, with growth mindsets. Um, I, I lost my trail of thought. Or there was one other thing I really wanted to emphasize tactically to actually get there. But I would say the big areas are just constantly learn. So keep up mm -hmm. on you know, the boot camps, the, the blogs, the podcasts, just keep trying to learn because there's a lot more that's coming out from the community that's, uh, that's, that's going to be helpful. Makes a lot of sense. So Jeremy, what are you currently reading and what book or article or blog post have you read recently that blew you away? So I think my most recent, actually, I am reading the latest on um, interview practice books, uh, actually, for, for product management, because uh, I've been in the field for a while, and, and interviews have evolved quite a bit. So years ago, we, we used to ask the estimation questions, you know, how many golf balls fit in an airplane, and we moved more and more towards behavioral interviews. And I determined in, in my own experience in 11 years out here that I, I need more practice, actually. Uh, but it's been very helpful, both in those cases to prepare for future interviews, um, but also to get a better understanding of, of product sets. Uh, so I very much recommend those. I've been reading especially the books by uh, Lewis Lynn. Um, other than that, I am keeping up on you know, the podcasts, the, uh, the blogs, the newsletters. So Product Manager HQ, I find is very helpful. I continue to read from uh, design experts. There's been a, quite an evolution in customer onboarding. Uh, in particular, that's what I've been following on. Um, basically, years ago when iOS first launched, uh, there was this big push to make registration flows as simple as possible because you don't want drop off during registration. But then we would see that you get a lot of users registered but you have to look at the rest of the pipeline. Users can register, but you need them to be active and you know come back and become recurring users. So there's a lot of experimentation and newer and newer studies coming out from usability experts as they try different things to see what is effective in creating a healthier uh, onboarding flow. You know, another book I can recommend, Nir Eyal, I think he wrote something new after the book Hooked. Uh, that's one I highly recommend. Indestructible. Like Hooked, yeah. Uh, because what we're seeing from the book Hooked, which was just a great source of experience in a great source of knowledge and user experience. Uh, back in the day of gamification, I remember people thought we should make everything like a game and Nir Eyal finally came out and explained, no, it's not about making everything like a game. It's about taking the usability learnings of the gaming industry. Um, but he knew himself, you know, habit creation could be a good thing. It could be very dangerous. And he saw that it has been abused. I know he's writing some new things about how 
how to really create habits and not addiction. He's really emphatic about it. I'm emphatic about that as an ethical developer. So there are books coming out. There's still the, the content from the community, the articles, the, the blogs, the new podcasts, uh, and there's also curriculum content. So I've been teaching at a product school. I think it's a great boot camp. I've also been in touch with Carnegie Mellon University. They, as part of their MBA program now, they have an addition to the MBA, a master's in product management program. They're experimenting with it, um, but it's, it's an interesting take on potentially creating a major. Uh, I know that Stanford has also a course just on, on product management. So in the world of boot camps, the world of academia now, there are many options uh, to learn more about product management. And, and I certainly encourage everyone to, to really take a look at those. There's a lot of opportunity there to find a style of teaching that suits, suits your, your needs. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure having you. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me either on LinkedIn or yeah, feel free to check out my consultancy. It's uh, apistrategist.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Jeremy. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. It was uh, great talking to you as well. Awesome.